Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is David Shu, and as uh, it was mentioned earlier, I'm here actually representing NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association. Um, after I retired last year, uh, I'll get into the FireWise program, but they uh, asked me if I could help them part-time. Uh, the, uh, NFPA was asked to attend this conference and talk about what they're doing on a national and even a global level of uh, dealing with the fire protection issues. What I'm going to do is change it up a little bit. I've been listening to all these presentations over the last two days, and quite frankly, after having spent 32 years working on fire lines and dragging hose and spending weeks at a time in these massive fires, I'm wondering why I'm still even alive right now uh, with all the scary tactics that are up there. But um, I'm gonna talk about the structures. Another one of my backgrounds is that I'm also a licensed architect. Uh, that's what I did before I became a volunteer firefighter. And uh, so I know the structures and how they're built and I now know how fires are impacting them and destroying them. So I'm gonna talk about what is causing structures to be impacted as much as they are and contributing to this catastrophic uh, event that we're beginning to see more and more. And before I get started with it, I wanted to uh, just tell you that the firefighters that were in the video yesterday, uh, Gino de Graffenreid and Jason Novak, uh, I know both of them really well. They both used to work for me. Uh, yesterday, I couldn't help, but after the, uh, after the seminar, I sent both of them an email. Gino's on vacation, but Jason sent a long email back to me. Uh, that was a very difficult video for him to film. And uh, I wanted to pass along to you that he was very gracious uh, in uh, thanking us for watching it. Uh, he does want to take the opportunity to try to pass that message along of how important it is for the change in culture of firefighters to open up and talk about these uh, traumatic experiences that we all go through throughout our career. So I just wanted to mention that. So as we get involved in this, we've all talked about the fact that California's always had a lot of large fires. Through millennium, it's a part of the natural landscape. It's been around for many, many years, and none of us are not used to it. But the fact is, and Jack Cohen, you've heard his name spoken. He's a retired scientist researcher from Uni uh, Uni Uni United States Forest Service in Missoula, Montana. He has this great statement that says, wildfires are inevitable. We're not ever going to get rid of them. We can't stop them, nor should we. One of the biggest problems is that we've suppressed them for way too long, and that's contributing to the facts that we're having such large catastrophic fires today. But wildland urban disasters don't have to be. And so how do we connect with that, and how do we try to mitigate the number of structures burning down? So let's just talk about a couple of observations that I have. I'd like to share with you, I've heard everybody talking about the new normal. You know, we're all saying that, the new normal, the new normal. I'm here to posit a statement that says, I don't think it's new anymore for us. This is just plain normal. I think what we're seeing here, unfortunately, is exactly what we're going to be experiencing for some time to come. But if we think about it, it's not really a wildfire problem. We're living in the middle of a natural wildfire ecosystem. So, it's a structure and infrastructure and homes burning down problem. How do we live more resiliently and more successfully in the middle of a wildfire environment and try to minimize the impact of those fires when they occur? And to a fire, of course, everything is fuel. Vegetation, structures, vehicles, unfortunately, human beings. Anything that's in the way is fuel for that fire. We're not going to fix this by simply hiring more firefighters and buying more fire engines. And we are already using DC-10s and 747s as air tankers. I don't think you can get much bigger than that. So we're at the max of what we can use out there, but that's not stopping these things. The amount of energy being released by these catastrophic fires is so great that there's simply nothing in the human arsenal that can ever stop them. It's like trying to put out an atomic bomb after it's dropped. It can't be done. So there's no single solution to this. If anybody ever comes up to any of you and says, aha, I've got the solution to solve it, they're lying because there is no one solution. It is an entire combination of things and we're gonna talk about that. Just the cycle of what happens. These severe fire conditions exist from fuels, weather, topography, all of these things come together and suddenly we get an ignition and the fire starts growing with rapid intensity. 
The fire starts burning, it gets into more populated areas, it turns into an urban conflagration and starts to overwhelm the resources coming in. So there's not enough firefighters to park in every driveway and start suppressing every structure that is burning and it starts overwhelming the resources and therefore the fire protection gets reduced they start focusing on just simply life safety and getting people out of the way, and pretty soon we have a complete disaster on our hands. And we're seeing that over and over again. We've talked about this chart. I'm amazed at how many times it's come up in, in, in the, this day, but CAL FIRE keeps three top 20 lists. One is the largest number of fatalities. One is the largest fires by acreage which is this chart, and one is the most destructive fires, and these are all in the history since we've been keeping records going back into the 1800s. This happens to be the largest California wildfires, as it's been stated before, 75%, if you look at the dates on those, 75%, 15 of the top 20 largest wildland fires have all occurred since the year 2000. But what I really want to point out is the significant sequence that they're beginning to burn. If you look up there on number eight, it's called the Matahia Fire. It burned in September of 1932 and was the largest fire in the history of the state for 71 years. Until 2003 when the Camp Fire burned and eclipsed it in 2003. The Camp Fire stayed on the number one list for 14 years until the Thomas Fire eclipsed it in December of all times, not in the peak of fire season, in December of 2017, 14 years later after the campfire, and the Thomas fire remained on that number one top of the list for only seven months until the Mendocino complex took over. Now the Mendocino has now been there for 11 months. So it's going to go for a full year, I hope, before we go. But what does 2019 hold for us? We don't really know. If we look at the most destructive fires, the same type of rapid sequence, if you look at the dates of those, 50% of them, 10 of the top 20, have all occurred in just the last four years. Four years, and we've suffered half of the most destructive fires in the top 20 list that we've ever seen before. So these are the stump numbers. One of the jobs I had in CAL FIRE is that we created a data collection program. It started in 2014 and we've moved it on through 2018. The current list is a little bit over this, but these are the number of structures that are damaged or destroyed by wildfires just in the state of California, just in the last four years. The number is over 41,000 st structures. As far as we know, this is the only database of its kind anywhere in the world, and so there's a lot of researchers. NFPA, uh, NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, many academic universities are using this to study, and so we're looking at these details, and we'll talk more about this. I'm gonna go into a little bit of history because when you look at fires, they repeat themselves. So this is actually a footprint of the Atlas fire that burned in Napa, just to the east of Napa in 2017. And you can see, I'll hopefully do this right, this fire that you can see the black outline, that is the Atlas Peak fire in 2017. But if you look at this big red bar, uh, portion right up here, this is another fire that burned in 2000, or I'm sorry, 1981, 31 years before the uh, Atlas fire, and it burned almost in the same footprint. If you look at it, it has eerily the same configuration. So in 2017, when the Atlas fire started, it even had the same name because it virtually started at the same place. It burned in almost the same footprint, but... In 1981, there weren't very many structures there. There were less than 100 homes were destroyed in 1981, as opposed to the Atlas fire that burned down over 1,000. So we can see the rapid size of this, and then we go to the campfire. Same type of thing. This is a history map of fires that have occurred over about the last 50 years around the town of Paradise. You can see Paradise very clearly right there in the middle of it, the fire actually started up here in the upper right-hand corner. That you can, it's very difficult to read, but look at the number of fires that have occurred over and over and over around Paradise. 
If you live in paradise, you're not a stranger, and this fire that occurred was not something like, oh my gosh, a fire's coming. You know that fire burns around there. It has burned over and over again for many, many years. It just so happened that everything lined up and you had the uh, you had all the circumstances that came to play with the right weather conditions and paradise found itself right in the middle of the path the interesting thing about paradise and I'm going to give them some kudos because in 2008 they had a large fire just to the east of town called the Humboldt fire the Humboldt fire threatened the town of paradise and came very very close burned a number of homes down but it didn't kill anyone and they then put together a very very aggressive CWPP which is a community wildfire protection plan and that resulted in a very very strong one of the best evacuation plans that I've ever seen a community develop and over the years they have practiced that over and over again in fact the community of paradise actually practiced their evacuation plan last July just a few months before the campfire started I'm going to make an argument that had they not done the aggressive work of putting their CWPP together and practicing their evacuation routes as bad as that fire was I would argue that it could have been much, much worse because they had actually recognized their risk and practiced it. How many communities do that? Not enough, I would argue. So this is the history map or the uh, fire progression map and you can see from where it started that blue uh, kind of going into the green. That's the first 12 hours. The first 12 hours of this fire it was almost just a little below 60,000 acres, which is 5,000 acres per hour, every hour for 12 straight hours. So that's how fast this fire was moving, and we're beginning to see this over and over again. So I'm going to talk a little bit about embers. I'm going to run out of time here. The most important thing that is igniting structures are embers, and we're beginning to do more and more research. Uh, several of these pictures are from IBHS the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, uh, which is doing research back in South Carolina at their lab. But our data is showing us this. And all of you who are statisticians or researchers, look at those numbers, 80 to 90%, which is a huge number, folks, 80 to 90% of every structure that is ignited by a wildfire is strictly due to embers, either directly or indirectly. And if your structure ignites, you only have about a 5 or 10% chance of it not being completely 100% destroyed. So we know that structures are burning. We know that embers are igniting them. So I'm going to make the argument that that's where we need to focus our efforts. And so what are we going to do about this? Where's the silver bullet? Where can we do this? I'm going to ask that we start thinking about our communities being more resilient and our structures being more resilient. Three ways for a structure to ignite, either by embers, radiant heat, or direct flame contact. But we know that embers are the main cause. Okay, home survival is a combination of vegetation and other combustibles on the pro uh, property, can, uh, also coupled with the building materials and the details of, of how those structures are put together. I'm going to talk about, too, the non-combustible zone. It is a zone, if you think about a moat, zero to five feet out around the edge of the house in a non-combustible format, something that doesn't burn. Because when these embers start attacking these homes and blowing against these structures, if there's nothing at the base of the house to ignite, then you've just reduced the impact of those uh, structures from burning down. As far as NFPA goes, one of their biggest things is they're a wildfire division, which I'm working for, and they go into the uh, FireWise community. So I'm going to go through some of their websites here, but the goals are to get community engagement and work with communities around the country. Uh, the FireWise program is an individual program. We're encouraging individuals to really look at their own property. Uh, people have to know how to do their own maintenance. Neighbors working with neighbors, we've heard lots of those kind of comments here uh, throughout the time and reducing the risk to themselves and first responders. There's over 1,500 FireWise communities that are established throughout the United States. California leads the way with about 210 
uh, communities that are FireWise communities. Uh, and so they're also teaching a class called the ASAP class, the Assessing Structure Ignition Potential from Wildfire. It's a two-day class. It's being put on all over the country. You can look on the website for uh, classes that are being given in various communities. Uh, there's also a class that people can take, and the insurance industry is really looking into this very closely, to become certified wildfire mitigation specialists, which gives you the training to go around and look at individual structures and find out what the risks of that structure are from wildfire. Uh, we're literally looking at preparing the homes for wildfire. What can we do? Looking at the threats, where it's placed on the landscape, where the fire is going to come from, uh, the home ignition zone around the house. The research wing of NFPA is taking the data that we have and really looking at all of these topics, attics and crawl space vents, uh, the decks, uh, fencing, all of these types of things that they're really studying a lot along with IBHS and other groups uh, that are looking at this. But we're really looking at preparedness tips. You know, have you, uh, how many of you like to have your uh, nice uh, wood pile stack stacked up on your deck so that it's easy to get to to take into your fireplace? Well, thank you for just putting a lot of kindling on the side of your uh, house. So there's virtual workshops. There are, uh, you know, uh, e-learnings that you can go online and, and train yourself to look if you want to know more about how structures are being impacted. They have very, very good clips on YouTube channels where you can watch people uh, walking around and talking about uh, structure threats. And of course, some very, very strong and good social media sites, uh, e-newsletters, and then the research uh, pamphlets that come out uh, talking about the results and how they can be used for information in your world. Uh, this is a global event. The fact is California seems to be at ground zero right now, but keep in mind the fact that over 160 people died in Greece last summer. 130 people died in Portugal the year before. It, Italy uh, it has experienced wildfires. There's been wildfires in South Africa. Uh, Chile has experienced the largest wildfires in history just last year. Australia, of course, always has wildfires. The country of Sweden had their largest and most destructive wildfires in history just last year. So this is a global problem. This is not just singled out in California. So what is this? We just haven't figured it all yet, out yet. The science is going forward. It's moving uh, along. But again, like I said, buying more engines isn't going to solve the problem. We have to understand the science better and understand the research. We're going to understand that as it comes forward. Designing the building and detailing it and maintaining it has a huge impact on the survivability of structures. And where a project or a structure is built on the landscape also comes into play. The location on the site, how you cluster communities, all of those things from land use planning. I'm going to make an argument that this is an all hands on deck event. Not one industry. We can't keep thinking of this as a fire department problem. It isn't the fire department's problem. It's everybody's problem. How buildings are being designed and approved and maintained. Uh, landscapers, can you go to Home Depot and is anybody going to talk to you about buying plants and maybe not putting them within that five foot zone around your house? Probably very few. Well, I would argue that no one at Home Depot knows that. So the insurance industry, environmental issues that we've talked about here this week, uh, the last couple of days on smoke impacts, the elected officials have to have the political will to do things about it. Coffee Park, I'll just share this with you, and I'm not trying to throw them under the bus, but I will a little bit. The mayor and the city council of the city of Santa Rosa, when the Coffee Park fire and the Tubbs fire was burning through Santa Rosa, before the smoke even cleared, they were in front of every camera swearing that they were going to impose the safest fire safety regulations that they could find. But when the permitting came along, all of Coffee Park, all the fire safety regulations were waived. They didn't require any of those homes to have fire safety regulation requirements, and they're rebuilding those homes up to 25% larger than the previous footprint with all the wooden fences connecting them and the bark mulch right up against the homes, which is just a big bag of kindling that they're laying around the homes. And that's what you will see if you drive through Coffee Park today.
So people have very short memories. But we've got to get the political will to do different things about it. Uh, we've got to get people to understand their ownership and the maintenance that they have to maintain. And I love this. It, it's not rocket science. It's a lot more difficult. It's social change. It's changing behavior of how people think and how people will act. And on that, we'll take questions after the uh, end of it, and Smokey will help me. So thank you very much.